in January of this year, we had a business meeting and we began that meeting by reflecting on the story of Samuel, the one when God calls his name. And he didn't know what he was hearing, but he talked with Eli and he learned the prayer, speak Lord, your servant is listening. And at that time, I invited the church to join me in, in making that our prayer for 2020. We did not know that our lives were about to be disrupted by a virus. We did not know that we only had a few more worship services in our church building before it would sit empty for the next six months. And we don't know what's next. How do you make sense of any of this other than to pray, speak Lord, your servant is listening. I believe that God inspired that focus for our church. And I believe it's the focus we need to have as we transition now into worshiping in our church building. And that's the focus of this message, that God would speak to us individually and speak to us as a church and that we would be led by God. Would you join me in praying as we open the word? Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness to lead your people, to speak to us. You've been speaking to us in this time. You've spoken to us before. You will lead us by your voice as we move forward with you. And we ask that right now you could have our ears, that we could surrender our attention to you and that you would speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text today is John chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. It's an illustration about a shepherd who speaks and sheep who hear his voice. And it comes out of a conversation that Jesus is having after he healed a man who was born blind. So the flow of chapter 9 ends with this conversation where Jesus says this. This is verse 36. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. So some of the Pharisees started to piece together what he was saying and said, Hey, are you calling us blind? And Jesus replied in verse 41, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. So that's how chapter 9 ends, and that's the conversation that leads Jesus to say what he said about the sheep and the shepherd. And there's a lot of hope, because just as Jesus was able to heal the man that was blind, he's able to help those sheep who struggle to hear his voice. But there's also a great caution, because we see that their guilt was connected to their insistence that they could see. And we see now in the sheep and the shepherd that our error is connected to our insistence that we hear the shepherd correctly. Their assumption that they could see kept them blind. And our assumption that we already hear God correctly could keep us from listening to his voice. And then we go to chapter one, verses 1 and 2. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So let's just identify some of the characters here. In these verses, we have sheep. And the sheep are the church. We see that because in verse 11, it says that those sheep are the ones that the good shepherd laid down his life for. And then we see that there's a door and Jesus is the door. Verse 9, he says, I am the door. He is the only way to salvation. And then we see that there is a thief. So the thief is Satan. He is the one in verse 10 that comes to steal and kill and destroy. But if you take the illustration a bit far, further, the thief is any under shepherd, any leader of God's people that enters into the fold without going through the door 
of Christ. And then there is the shepherd. And Jesus says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. So yes, Jesus is both the door and the shepherd. He can do that. He can do whatever he wants. Jesus is everything in this illustration. And you might take the illustration further to say an under shepherd would be one who leads through the door of the great shepherd. So that's the big picture of what we're talking about. There's a good shepherd who speaks and leads his sheep and their sheep who hear and follow. Verses three and four say, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Notice what the shepherd does. The shepherd speaks to the sheep and leads them. Notice what the sheep do. The sheep hear his voice and follow. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And this is how the church is designed to operate. God's church is a voice activated church. Voice activation technology has advanced to the point that is kind of weird. We have devices and machines and appliances, and some of these know our voice and they obey it. So you don't have to get up in the morning when it's cold, but you can give a voice command to your thermostat to turn up the heat in your house and you can stand under the covers for a few more minutes. And when you are ready to get up, if you go sit in your recliner and the sun's in your eyes, you can just tell your window shade to lower a little bit. And then you can give a voice command to your smart speaker and have some music played. And without getting up, you could start a hot drink by just giving a voice command to your electric kettle in the kitchen. Your whole house obeys your voice. You're in control, except if you talk in your sleep. Then you might burn your house down. But you know, there's probably a smart device that tells the other smart devices that you're sleeping and keeps those things from happening. There's so much connection it's a hyper-connected world, and it gives us control, and there's something that just feels wrong about that. It kind of turns us into com control freaks, because it's not our voice that the world is supposed to follow. The thing that feels weird is it's the wrong voice in control. God's church is a voice-activated church, but it's not my voice or your voice that activates the church. It is God's voice that activates God's church. So I want to think of God giving life to the church with the illustration of electricity getting to a light bulb. And there's a lot of ways you might get electricity to a light bulb. You can flip a switch. God doesn't do that. He has the power to flip a switch and turn things on and off, but he doesn't violate that whole freedom thing where he wants us to choose him. And so God doesn't force us in the way he leads us. That's not what the shepherd would do. You could hook up wires to a bicycle and pedal and generate your own electricity, which is kind of what we do sometimes, trying to manufacture life in the church by our own works. Well, God's not doing that. He's not breathing hard, out of breath, trying to pedal and keep up and supply us with electricity. And do you remember those clap-on lights? Clap on, clap off. God is not fueling the church with his applause. He's not impressed by what we're doing. Um, sometimes we try to do that, operating out of pride, and we feel that when people are happy, uh, the church must be doing good because they like what I'm doing. It's not about applause or us doing well. That's not how we get power. And it's not on a schedule. You know, we have the ability to program our, our lights in our home to come on at a certain time, go off on a certain time. That's not how we get power. God has not ordained a set schedule that he forces us into, and there's no way that we can vote it or decide we're going to have power. We're going to be activated and on this day. We're going to do this and this routine. God works in his way and on his time, and we respond. But none of these work because God doesn't violate freedom. He works in relationship with us. So the way that God gives power to the ch his church is in relationship by 
having a voice activated church. That's the one that requires the relationship of us to hear and respond. And so as God is leading us, as he's giving electricity to that light bulb, he could do it in any way he wants, but he chooses to do it by speaking and letting us hear and respond and follow. God's church is a voice activated church. This truth is all over scripture. We see that God speaks and he's faithful to speak to his people. He's a communicator. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He's given us his word to communicate to us. Amos 3, 7, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. God speaks through prophets. John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. God speaks through the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. God speaks to us through creation all around us. God is faithful to speak. And God calls us to be people who listen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. That was the instruction that he gave on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son. What are you supposed to do about it? Listen to him. He is going to speak to you. Listen to him. In John chapter 8, verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. God speaks, his people listen. Romans 10 verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. That's how God designed his church. He's the good shepherd and he's faithful to speak and we're his sheep and we're just supposed to listen to that voice and follow him. I want you to listen to these words from the book, Desire of Ages, and this is from page 363. In all who are under the training of God is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs, or its practices. And everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us be still and know that I am God. Here alone can true rest be found. And this is the effectual preparation for all who labor for God amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, the soul that is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. The life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's heart. When we can get past all the noise of this world, there is a calm and loving, faithful, voice of our Heavenly Father, and we can individually hear Him speaking to our hearts. And even when everything else is going crazy, God's will and His work are still advancing, and He's calling people into that, and He has all throughout history. And the way that we join Him in that is that He speaks to us, and we, we listen, and we follow our shepherd. That is what happened with Samuel. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And think about so many others who were able to follow what God is doing. Think of Noah. 
Noah built this ark. He saved humanity. There was this remnant of humanity. He was faithful to God. Well, how did that happen? Genesis tells us, God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. And then God kept talking to Noah. And in verse 22, it says, Noah did everything that God commanded him. So God spoke and Noah listened. And we think of Abraham who left his homeland and went to a place that was not his own. It was the father of many nations. Well, how'd that happen? In Genesis 12, we read, The Lord said to Abram, leave your country. And a few verses later, we read, So Abram left as the Lord had told him. So you're probably getting the point by now. God speaks to us. But just in case it isn't clear, consider Moses, who led God's people out of slavery, and God spoke to him in a burning bush. Consider Paul, who was a great missionary, one of the greatest missionaries in history. And when he was Saul, God spoke to him on the road to Damascus and called him into his missionary work. Think of Martin Luther, the great reformer. He was spoken to by God when the words of Romans 1, 17 were impressed upon him. The just shall live by faith. Think of Ellen White who God has used as a mouthpiece and a pen to share his message with his church and who is one of the founders of a movement that's done so much good in the world. How did all that happen? Well, God spoke to her in many visions. And one of the early visions, she's confused and she hears a voice and it says, look up and look a little higher. And God spoke and gave clarity and ultimately Think of Jesus and the way he lived his life on this earth. He did nothing on his own. He did only what he heard from the Father. Isaiah chapter 50 is a powerful messianic scripture that tells us, it shows us the model of how Jesus listened to the Father. Listen to these words. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. Those are some powerful concepts. God wakens our ears morning by morning. We can listen like one being taught of God. We don't have to be rebellious and close our ears to him. But this is kind of the ideal for the church. The ideal is God speaks and we hear it and we obey it and we follow it. And that doesn't always happen. People don't always get along in the church. People don't always agree in the church. Sometimes we get some mixed messages. And these mixed messages don't just come because we stopped caring about the shepherd's voice. In fact, a lot of times they come because we do care and we are listening to the shepherd's voice And we believe we understand, and that gives us the conviction behind all of our not getting along. Because I'm hearing from the shepherd, and you don't agree with me. And so you must not be listening to the shepherd. And so the sheep get mixed messages. And what do we do when we get those mixed messages? Well, right in the text, we see some reminders that are true of us that might help us sort out what we can do with these mixed messages. Look back at verse 3, where it says, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He calls us each by name. So he speaks individually to each sheep. When the sheep get mixed messages, it's possible that both are from God. See, we assume when it's a mixed message that one of them has to be wrong, And truth doesn't change, but truth is big. And so maybe what he's speaking to one and what he's speaking together aren't at odds with each other, but they actually fit together in the greater plan of God. So one way we can check ourselves when the sheep get mixed messages is to go a little further with the shepherd and see if maybe those messages are actually both spoken by the voice of the shepherd. And look at verse 5. 
a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. All right, so we see that there is another voice here. And when things are going like they should, the sheep don't follow that voice because they don't know that voice. But when the sheep get mixed messages, it is possible that one or both of the sheep are listening to the wrong voice. Scripture says that not every spirit is from God. We should test the spirits. And not every thought that I've had about spiritual things is from God. I need to test myself and check myself with Scripture. Check myself with other believers. And here's how we should do this. When we check ourselves and look to see we're looking at the right voice, listening to the right voice, let's check us first. Rather than storming into a situation where sheep have mixed messages and assuming that someone else is listening to the devil, let's make sure we look at ourselves, take the log out of our own eye, then we can see clearly to help our brother. Because it's possible that we're not hearing the right voice and we need to help one another to tune our ears to the voice of the shepherd. And then we look at verse 6. It says, This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. There's a bit of irony here because Jesus is talking about his sheep hearing his voice, and then it says his followers didn't understand what he was saying. When the sheep get mixed messages, it's possible that both messages are from the voice of the shepherd. It's the right voice. We just don't understand the voice. We don't understand the message. Maybe we will have to wait some time before it's clear. We need to go further in seeking God before it makes sense to us, which means we need to have a whole lot of humility about following the voice of the shepherd. We might hear his voice, but there might be a whole lot more to it. Like Abraham, who accurately heard the voice of God that said, go sacrifice your son. He didn't understand that voice, but he kept following after that voice and obeying that voice until God made it clear to him. And so there's a lot of humility that we have to have in responding to his voice rather than declaring policies based on the limited understanding of the voice we hear. We need to come together in seeking after God that he can open our eyes to understand him more clearly. So there's a lot of ways the sheep might get mixed messages. But here's the thing. Mixed messages are helpful because the goal is actually to hear God's voice, not to prove that I hear his voice perfectly or that I hear it better than someone else, but to hear him and follow him. So in this way, it's an asset for us to have other sheep that might hear it a little different because we can check each other. We can correct each other. We can teach one another. And so the solution to mixed messages is not arguing or unfriending people or building ourselves up in the pride of our opinion. The solution is coming together and seeking God because those who hear God's voice a little different aren't enemies of our faith. They are assets to it. They sharpen us and they help us go towards God. They are not stopping us from following the shepherd. They're helping us clarify his voice so that together we can follow him better. Mixed messages can actually be helpful. And mixed messages are not going away. When we are with God for eternity, we are going to hear his voice perfectly and consistently with nothing interfering with our communication but right now we don't hear it perfectly and we get things wrong. And so mixed messages are not going away. But if we stop hearing God's voice differently, it might mean we stopped hearing his voice altogether because we're fooling ourselves if we all see it exactly the same. And so long as we have a heart for God, we're going to feel conviction. We're going to have things we, we need to stand on and we need to stand for and so we shouldn't ignore those convictions, but we should seek God together to better follow his voice because God's church is a voice-activated church. At the beginning of this message, I reminded us of that business meeting we had back in January, the one where we began to pray the prayer, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And to be honest, 
I hesitate to focus our attention back there on that meeting. Because if you remember, it was a stressful meeting. There were some controversial points with strong feelings, some deep convictions, and we're going to have convictions. And that's a good thing. But it didn't feel good. It felt divided. Like there was a weight and we knew it wasn't right. And so what is the point of focusing our attention back there? I think there's some value in it because we're at a point of transition in our church. We're about to go back to using our facilities for our worship services. And when we go back, we're not going back to division and disunity. We're going back to a good shepherd who is faithful to speak. And I want to be the people, I want to be the sheep who are so interested in hearing his voice that we're going to lay down pride of opinion and hurt and feelings that were right. And we are going to seek hard after God so that he can be the leader of this church. He promised to be the head of our church. And we need that because I don't know how to lead a church. I don't know what's happening next month or what church is going to look like two months from now. We need Christ to be the head of this church. He is a good shepherd and we're sheep who listen to his voice. And we have a fresh start. When we come back, we get to choose the church we come back to. And there's so many good things about this church in, in the history and the foundation and where this church has been. I want to take all those good things and choose to come back to a church that follows hard after God, seeks him and wants to hear his voice and let him be our leader who realized that we are going to fail if the Holy Spirit is not poured out upon us to lead us. If you look through scripture at the way the church is designed, he is to be the leader. The church is perfectly designed to fail if God is not the leader, if God does not supply the power. And that's the church we're coming back to. We're coming back to a church that is going to seek hard after God. I want to share a story with you of revival. There is an incredible history of revival that happened in the Hebrides in the mid 20th century. It broke out in 1949. The stories of what God did during that time are amazing. And one of the things, the pieces that sparked revival was a prayer meeting. There's two sisters, Christine and Peggy Smith, and they prayed through the night for revival and they sent letters to an evangelist named Duncan Campbell. And eventually, he refused some of the first invitations. Eventually, he came and he was a central figure God used to bring revival in the Hebrides. And there's a story that he tells uh, to a friend who wrote a book. His friend's name is Wesley Dole. And he wrote a book called Let God Guide You Daily. And he recounts this story that Duncan Campbell told him. And it happened uh, towards the end of the revival. Duncan Campbell was out of the Hebrides and he was speaking at a conference in Ireland. He was scheduled to give the message the next day and he heard an inner voice that said, Burn Array. And uh, he heard it again, Burn Array. And he heard a third time the word Burn Array. And he realized at that time that God was calling him to an island called Bernere. So he went to the chairman of the conference and said, hey, uh, you'll have to excuse me. The Holy Spirit's leading me to Bernere. And he says, hey, you're on to speak tomorrow. And he says, I can't, I can't help it. I got to go where the Holy Spirit's calling me. So he, he set out and he found a flight. He couldn't get into Bernere with a flight, but he found a flight to the nearest island that he could fly to. And he got out and looked for transportation by boat and he could not find anything there, but he found a fisherman and said, hey, do you know how to get to Burner Ray? Fisherman said, I, I can take you for a fee. And he, he got him on the boat and got him over to the island and left him there on the shore. And then Duncan Campbell climbed up and he found that he was uh, near this farmer's field. And he walked into the field and saw the farmer and said, 
to the farmer, could you tell the nearest pastor that Duncan Campbell has arrived? And they didn't have a pastor, so he said, hey, could you tell the elder? And uh, the farmer looked at him and said, well, the elder is expecting you. He has a place for you to stay, and he has already announced that you will be preaching at the meeting tonight at 9 o'clock. There was no letter sent. Duncan Campbell had never even heard of the island Bernaray. He knew nobody from there. He was not in any communication, but this elder had spent time in his barn praying three days before, and God had given him the message that he was going to send Duncan Campbell. So with no communication, he arranged for Duncan Campbell to speak, and God spoke to Duncan Campbell's heart and led him there. And so that night, he went to the prayer meeting, and God's Spirit was in that place, and revival broke out in the island of Bernaray. And in his memories in that book, Let God Guide You Daily, he recounts this. When God has people who prevail in prayer and people who know how to recognize the voice of the Spirit and obey without question, there is no limit to what God can do. That's what I want. I want God to move among us. The greatest sign of life in our church is not that the doors are opened to gather, but that our ears are opened to God. And I'm excited about the doors being open, but I'm desperate for our ears to be open. And we have seen that God's church can move forward without a building. God's church can move forward without so many of the good things we have. But God's church cannot move forward without the Good Shepherd. We are desperate for Him to lead us, for Him to be the head of this church. And as we close this service, as we close this, this season of our church, I want to pray. And I invite you, um, if you're able, to pause and kneel with me as we pray and to commit our hearts and our lives and our church to God. If you're driving, um, kneel and pray later. Find a time when you can do that and kneel before God and plead with Him that He would lead us at this time. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you are faithful. That this gospel we teach is real. That you really do lead us and fill us with your life. And I just have a sense of great need. We have an exciting transition in front of us. It's going to be fun to see everyone. And when we come back, I want it to be all about you. And I want to get out of the way. And I ask that you would just accept our, our offering right now of surrender individually and as a church. That you would come among us and lead us without any restraint. That there would be no limit to what you might do among us. We give you our hearts. We commit our church to you. We commit this transition to you that when we walk in this building on September 5, there would be the sweet spirit of Jesus here. And we would be reminded that this is your church. We surrender to you now. Thank you for being a faithful, good shepherd. And Lord, help us. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.